Hi, Matthew. Thanks for coming along today. Pleasure, Nick. Anytime anyone wants to talk about soil, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've written this amazing book. It's beautifully written. Um, thank you. I've been finding it uh, quite engaging. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think I, this is the book I wanted to read about soil. I got excited about soil really late in life and didn't realise how incredible it was. And then I thought, there's all this stuff about soil and I can't find it except in maybe children's books and in really simplified terms. And I thought, there should be a book for grown-ups um, who aren't necessarily gardeners, who aren't necessarily farmers, who, are, who want to get, who know something more about the thing that nourishes us. Yeah, I've found a similar thing about soil. It's um, often presented as this impenetrable science or, <laughs> or really super simplistic and there's not a lot in between. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, there is a bit of a, a growing awareness of how important it is to human health and, and the health of our planet. And um, you've done a, a fantastic job in this book of really outlining that. But also, you know, it's, it's not uh, just theoretical. It's actually quite a practical book as well. There's lots of useful things that people can take out of it. Yeah, so I wanted people to get, um, I guess I wanted people to care about soil. And if you, to care about it, you have to know it or understand it in some way. And I wanted it to be a book for like anyone who eats to care about soil. But then once you've got that caring about soil, what can you do? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's not a, a how-to book, it's not a gardening book, but it's about, um, you know, what are the big picture ways to nourish soil, no matter where you are, no matter what, what you know, the geological lottery of your soil type where you live in your part of the world and your rainfall, um, what are the basic rules for everybody? And so I tried to sort of cover those off to, to give people, uh, you know, to give people that sense of that, that every bit of soil matters. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's this much in a pot plant or it's, you know, a thousand acres, every bit matters and, and every bit can be affected by what we do as humans. Yeah. So, I mean... For those of us who haven't really thought much about soil in the in the past, um, you know what actually is soil? What 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 makes soil <laughs> soil healthy? Yeah, what makes it soil? Yeah, so soil, I guess it, you know, it's dirt with some other stuff, and and so it, you know, dirt is essentially just crushed up rock, pretty much. Yeah. Um, so so the, the 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 bulk of soil is uh, the weight of soil is 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 forms of crushed up rock. So it's rock that's been broken down physically or chemically. Um, uh, generally, um, and, and so it's sand, silt, and clay usually, um, and that's just grades of how fine it's been crushed. And then it has some dead stuff in it, so organic matter, so it could be dead roots or you know um, dead dead leaves, but it also has living things. And that's where it's it's it, it, a tiny fraction of soil, only about one percent at the most, is is living. And that's um, it can be obvious things like worms or, or soil mites. You can see it might be. Um, uh, fungi, you might be able to see the white threads of fungi through the soil, but it's also um, microscopic things. And that's where, where my mind got blown when I started to think about soil and someone said, oh, you know, there's more living things in a teaspoon of soil than there are humans on the planet. So 10 billion living things in a teaspoon of healthy soil. And when you hear that, you kind of go, ah, oh, that's what makes soil soil. That's, what, that's why it's not just dirt. So it's not just crushed up rock. It has a food source for the living things and it has these living things and the living things are living in symbiosis with each other but also living in symbiosis with plants so for me one of the definitions of soil is yes it has you know, crushed up rock and it has some dead stuff and it has some living things but it also has an association with um, a plant or has recently had an association with a plant because all the, th the things in living in soil need a food source and the plant is the food source yeah, that magical photosynthesis you know the, this incredible ability of a plant to turn you know, air into peaches. It's, yeah, it's, and then the sugar that it then pumps into the soil to feed that. Yeah, yeah, that that idea. And I was, and I, I was like you, and I was at school. Photosynthesis was, you know, oh, plants breathe in. Yeah, you know, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants breathe yeah. in carbon dioxide. Breathe out oxygen. The oxygen we breathe in. So they help us breathe. And it's that's not actually the most magic. The magic thing is creating sugars using the sun's energy to create sugars um, out of carbon dioxide and water. And so that sh those sugars they use to make the peach and to make the peach tree. But a lot of those sugars, 20% at least, the plant feeds to the things under the soil. Yeah, and that's, that was a remarkable fact when I learned that, this idea that, you know, these plants out there that are growing, trying to build their own bodies, are actually, you know, constantly pumping 
sugar and and fuel down into the soil to feed the soil microbiome. Yeah, and I think that's where the science is. Yeah, soil science is really quite amazing. But you know, you, you need to when you're thinking about soil, you kind of got to also think about plants. And this is where I think sometimes the the connections are lost because someone's researching soil and someone's researching plants, but they're actually interacting. And plants we now know can can be dribbling out up to 100,000 different biochemicals into the soil. So through the ends of their roots, they are, they are dribbling out not just sugars, but it could be amino acids, the building blo blocks of protein, but it can be up to 100,000 different chemical substances that, are, that are, are put into the soil. And that allows plants to communicate with, them, with each other, to communicate with microbes. I mean, it seems fantastical and weird and, and sort of sci-fi, but um, that's, that's the system that has been built. Uh, over you know, um, you know hundreds of millions of years where a plant needs soil mm. and it needs things in soil and it can only get them through uh, an association with living things in soil yeah it's that that thing that we like to do isn't it where we we try to pull apart nature into its you know constituent elements <laughs> and uh, i can't remember the exact quote but something of it um, about uh, you know, you cannot unpick a thread of nature and expect the whole carpet not to unravel. It, it, everything is is so deeply connected, and um, it, it's especially true in the in the complexity of the of the soil. Yeah, um, and I, and I think what's really interesting is as we're making these leaps and bounds in terms of understanding what lives in soil. What we now know is that we don't know what 98% of them are. So, so we know they're there because we can do shotgun DNA analysis and all sorts of stuff like that, but we don't know, actually know what they are. Or but what we, they do, or how but we they don't, react. Yeah, we don't need to actually not, you know, identify all, all of the, you know, the, 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 the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of species of bacteria and archaea and fungi and you know, protists and stuff. But we need to understand that they have a purpose and a role and they exist for a reason and um, we don't need to name them all and science will try to, but we need to understand that it is it is a complex um, living ecosystem underneath our feet. That it's not just crushed up rock. It's not inert. That it it, it actually has biology. Yeah, and that to me that's always been uh, one of the sort of follies of, of trying to understand soil is that it's it's way too complicated to actually pull <laughs> apart and understand it at this um, this specific detail of exactly how everything relates to each other. Even even you know, soil chemistry, which is a much better understood uh, science than um, soil biology. It's still so infinitely complicated, yeah. the relationships between the different elements and how they affect each other. Um, so given that, that it is this sort of unknowable world, you know, this unknowable cosmos down there, I keep looking down at our garden down there at the soil <laughs> and, and imagining what's happening down in there. Um, what, what would you say for perhaps people who haven't got access to a garden or, or aren't farmers, um, you know, what's the way that they, or the one way that they can do the most to support um, this incredible world that's down there? I think the most important thing is diversity. So if you ha have access to soil, growing a diversity of things, but if you don't, farmers and growers produce things on your behalf and every plant takes something from soil and every plant gives something from soil and soil likes to have a diversity of plants growing in it so if everybody just buys, buys carrots broccoli and potatoes which is pretty much if you're a market gardener that's all you grow that's how you make your money that isn't good for soil what soil wants is 60 or 80 different species so it wants some kohlrabi it wants some spigarillo it wants things that you probably haven't heard of or, or you know um celeriac you know it, it, the more you can eat a diverse range of of um, things that are grown in, in soil, the, the more that allows a farmer to be able to replenish their soil and nourish their soil because then they can grow the diversity that soil needs. So as an eater, you can directly affect um, soil health by eating a diversity. But, but and the beautiful synergy is that when you eat a diversity of plant products, you end up with a more um, robust immune system, and we know this. If the more, the more, the more, the, the wider variety of plant products you can eat every week, um, the more you you nourish your own immune system by feeding your gut microbiota the, the things that live in and on us, and at the same time, you know, you're allowing you're, you're feeding soil, and it, it seems all that stuff can seem far far fetched, but that's how the system was built. We were we evolved in a in a you know, you know, in where there was lots and lots of different things to eat over different seasons in different parts of the world, and we ate all of those. And so our bodies are designed to have that, and the soil is designed to grow that. Yeah, I mean, 
one of the points that you make in the book is is this um, idea around nutrition often being framed in terms of the elements that you're eating, you know, the different actual nutrients. And a lot of the time, what's more important is the actual, um, not just the uh, actual microbes, but also the the uh, prebiotic material that you're putting into your gut to support that. Yeah. <coughs> that healthy microbiome. Yeah, and so from soil we get, uh, soil helps inoculate your immune system through the things that live in soil. So the microbes that are in soil are actually really good to ingest. Um, uh, you know, in, in healthy soil, and and um, but also the, the the things that grow in that healthy soil also feed the things that live in and on us, mm. and you know that's that's just how the system was set up. And we, what we've done over time is simplified, 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 and said we know what human nutrition is, we know what plant nutrition is, we know what help, you know, we know how the the things to feed to a plant to to make it grow bigger and quicker, um, but actually. The, the complexity of that is now becoming apparent. So, so it's not you know a hundred different things in food that we eat that are nutrients. It's closer to seventy thousand things that we eat in food that mm. are nutrients <laughs> and how they interact within us. And we, you know, again, is it knowable? Maybe it's unknowable, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't have to be um, complicated because we know that eating diversity, you know, of plants grown in healthy soil is is the best thing for you. Yeah, I was, I was actually struck by some of the simple stuff in the book. Um, you know, uh, like things that you can do to make sure that your soil is healthy. Make sure you water it. <laughs> you know, really <laughs> basic stuff like that. You know, keep it moist. Yeah, Because yeah. guess what? You know, water is life. Um, yeah, yeah. If, and it, it is that, that's the great thing about, you know, if you've got a patch of land and you want, you know, it could be, you know, just a tiny little area of, of your courtyard or something, you want to grow something and you don't have time and you want it to be your verdant garden, well, make it verdant with something. Just yep. water it so that something grows because those things are feeding the soil and they're, they're actually um, uh, doing the soil good in the time, that, you know, before you create the garden. So you might think of them as weeds, but they're not weeds. They have a, they're fulfilling a role in the ecosystem probably a very, very important role. They might be taking nitrogen out of the air and storing it in the soil or whatever they're doing. And they're, they're kind of fixing the soil ready for when you want to um, manage it. And as, as, as humans, we, we, can't, we can't run the system, but we can manage the system. And I like to think of us as conductors of the orchestra. So we can, we can sort of put in place what we're trying to get out of the soil, but the, 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 pe the people playing the trombone and you know, the people playing the castanet, you know, well, that's the microbes in the soil. So, so as conductors, we are just putting in place the, and, and, and directing what happens. But the work is being done by the, the trillions of things that live in the soil. And not stuffing it up. Not stuffing it up, yeah. <laughs> but, but simple things like, you know, just water it. You know, that's a pretty, pretty handy thing to do um, to keep everything alive. Um, keep green living plants. You know, don't, if you see soil, this is the thing, that if you can see soil, it's dying. You know, wherever you've got bare earth, it's dying. So as soon as you think that, you kind of go, oh, so that I need to keep it covered. So I've either got to have mulch or I've got to have a green mm. living plant or ideally both. Um, then, then that helps you, I guess, reframe how you manage your own little patch of soil. Mm. It's been one of the things that has, uh, I mean, you know, we're talking to an audience of, of people who are interested in permaculture and often, um, you know, they've probably heard some of these things before around around keeping soil protected and keeping it mulched and the diversity of plant life, keeping living mm. soil, not cultivating. Um, and what I always find is that um, sometimes people can take that message too far as well. And for instance, in a, in, a, in a garden environment where you're trying to grow annual vegetables, you know, you often do need to do some soil preparation or cultivation. Mm. Or, and I think that have people having a, a greater understanding of this immense capital value of the life in soil can allow you to, um, you know, perhaps draw down on that capital a little bit in order to get a yield. And, yeah. and I find that that's the same with trees, you know. I want people to feel confident to be able to chop down a tree because they've planted so many. Yeah. And it's the same deal with, with soil sometimes. Yeah, and everything's in a cycle and, and everything's a compromise. You know, so, and, and I've, I see this, you know, no, no cultivation. So don't dig, don't ever dig, right? Well, you know, when you walk through a forest, something has dug, like we see bandicoots on our place all the time, right? Nothing turns over a whole 20 acres, 20 centimeters down, yep. except a plow. Yep. But in nature, Constantly, little bits of soil are being, you know, moved around and turned by animals, and um, that's how soil is designed. It's designed to to have certain things happen to it. So you can fixate on don't 
dig or you know you don't cut a tree down or, or or whatever. But if you want to grow potatoes, you're gonna you're gonna disturb your soil. You're gonna you know disrupt the ecosystem. That's the cost of growing potatoes. Hmm. Um, the next year maybe you can grow something where you can just cut it off at ground level like broccoli or something and let all the roots die into the soil without having to dig. And and so you can still get the same result, but it it's a series of what do we want from soil and how and what does soil want. If we marry those two, that that that's when um, we everything gets the best result yeah beautiful yep um so uh is there any other tips or or things that you'd like to say to you know home gardeners about the the best way to encourage their soil to be healthy and to bring health into their life through caring for their soil yeah look i guess and this the the, the stuff i haven't spent like a couple of years researching and reading really dense scientific reports and 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 sort of analyzing it it comes down to um really simple stuff like what are the three most important things for for your garden you know comp in this order compost compost and compost i mean it's like it just it's what we knew 200 years ago <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know it's not that's what's beautiful about it it's not super complicated no. Um, despite the complexity in the, in the system, um, and uh, you know, so, so it, it really boils down to very, fairly simple stuff. You know, feed your soil. Yeah, you know, if, if you can, you know, get some some kind of seaweed or find your own seaweed and brew it up and feed that. Putting on compost. You know, keeping green living things. Mulching bare earth where you, where you can. Try not to turn it over too much. They're the sort of the simple things, and that that especially in a domestic sense, is really not that hard. It gets harder to manage you know, if you, yeah. as, as you get bigger, but it's still not impossible. People are doing brilliant things on scale. Yeah, yeah, it is a, a big advantage of, of uh, small-scale home gardening, it is, isn't it, that you can do things that don't make sense at a professional level. Yeah. The, you know, <laughs> the uh, enthusiastic amateur is very capable. Yeah, so, so as, at home, you know, like we, we have a market garden where we've got lots of rows. There's a row of carrots and there's a, a row of... Um, fennel or whatever. Um, An incredibly diverse market garden where that diversity <laughs> is brought in all over. Yeah, the yeah. Place. There's diversity between rows and over time, but at home it's like you know all these things are dotted around like you have in in a natural system. Hmm. So you 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 they're not in rows. That, that you've got a multiplicity of species within a small area, and that's a beautiful thing that you can do at home because when you go to harvest, you can just oh, oh there's some fennel. Oh, who knew the coriander was growing there? It's self seeded, and oh, you know, I've got this, you know, um, potato. Um, I'm going to bandicoot a few out the side, you know, because it hasn't grown that much. And you can do all of that domestically that nobody has the capacity to do um, on on in any sort of farm, even a small farm like ours. And I think that's the beauty of of having having your own patch of soil and being able to manage it and being able to grow something is that you can do stuff that nobody can do in a commercial sense and everything you grow, and this is the, beautiful, the really magic thing, the more you nourish your soil, the better everything you grow tastes. And I think that's, the, the book was driven, driven partly by going, why does the, every year the carrots, why do they taste better and better? And it's, you know, the same species, we've got the same sand, silt and clay, the same crushed up rock that we had 10 years ago, we've got the same rainfall, we've got the same amount of sunlight. What's changed? The biology, the living matter of, of, in our soil. And I think that, and then seeing that on the plate, the, Flavour change on the plate, like what joy. Yeah, especially for a chef. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially for a chef, a glutton, you know, which is my original. <laughs> Your original <career. laughs> um, fantastic, Matthew. Um, so the book is Soil, the incredible story of what keeps the earth and us healthy. Um, I might just get you to finish by reading this, just this last little paragraph oh, of uh, the introduction, which I think is just beautiful. I need my glasses for that. No worries. <clears throat> We have the capacity to slow climate change, grow an abundance of better tasting nutrient dense food, gradually alter the very genetic makeup of our bodies for the better and help heal the world. The answer is right in front of us and all around us and underneath us. All we need to do is stop treating soil like dirt. Brilliant. <laughs> no Thank you, Matthew. Thank you so much, Nick. I love it when you want to talk soil. <laughs> Anytime <laughs> you want to talk soil. Easy. Mm. Good. You happy? Perfect. I think so. Make sure your camera was working. Yeah, I'm gonna just in case we have to do that all over again. <laughs>